The Gospel of John records this interaction between Christ and a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, that unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of, a wa of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In John chapter 1, we see a revelation of who and what Jesus is. The word of God made flesh. God, very God, in the flesh. The light of the world. The very creator come into our flesh in order to bear witness about eternal life in his name. John the Baptist testifies of him. In John chapter 2, we see two signs. We move into signs that, that John is going to lay out that validate who Jesus is. The first sign, Jesus turning water into wine. The second sign, Jesus cleansing the temple. Both emphasizing that the old has gone, the new has come. That Jesus comes to give the new wine of the kingdom, the new wine of the kingdom that fills up the ritual jars of purification of the law to the brim so that there's nothing lacking. Jesus satisfies it all. And then he cleanses the temple and in there says that he speaks about himself being the new temple. That he is the means by which man is reconciled to God. John chapter 3, we come to Jesus' first teaching, his first teaching moment recorded by John. And it takes place in an interaction with a man named Nicodemus. So let's just really quick overview, verse 1 down to verse 15, so we get the general flow. And then let's draw out the implications of what these curious texts mean. Because we have to confess, there's some strange statements. As we read over it, we go, what does Jesus mean? Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He is a ruler of the Jews. Now, Nicodemus, the name, is actually not a Jewish name. It's a Greek name. So he probably comes from a wealthy, influential family, a cultured Jew, but a Jew, very Jew. He is one who is a ruler of the Jews, a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of 70 that handled all Jewish affairs. Remember, they're under Roman rule, so they don't have complete independence. There is the political societal strife between the Jews and the Romans. So that the Jews are looking for political deliverance. Reminder that the tensions that we see happening on Tuesday are nothing new. It's been part of the whole history of the world. Nicodemus, a Pharisee. This is a sect that is zealous for the law. Keeping the law. Abiding by the law. So he's a scholar. He's a ruler. He's cultured. And he's also a Jew of Jews. Nicodemus seems to be pictured, though, as we look at this text, he seems to be a picture of those that are spoken of at the end of chapter 2. You remember at the end of chapter 2 in verse 23, it says, when he was in Jerusalem, Jesus, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them. Why? Because they had a spurious faith, an incomplete faith. Not that they didn't believe enough. And I want you to create that type of doubt in you. We're like, did I believe enough? No, it's a faith that really they're not believing in the right Jesus. 
They're, they're, they're seeing an incomplete picture of Christ. They don't really see Jesus for who he is. They don't really believe in him for who he is. And it seems that Nicodemus is an example of those that are just mentioned. Nicodemus. Someone who is, has a partial, a curious belief in who this Jesus is, but an insufficient belief nonetheless. Now he calls Jesus rabbi. Now Im imagine that, that this ruler of the Jews, a scholar of scholars, a leader among the Jews, this young man in his early 30s, Jesus, who has no formal training, has no Jewish rabbi to say, yeah, I apprenticed under him. Like Paul said, I apprenticed under Gamaliel. That's my, my, my theological training, my, my seminary pedigree. Jesus has nothing. And yet there is such power and authority in his character that Nicodemus says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God. Now notice this. He recognizes and sees that Jesus is something different. He recognizes that he is from God, but he doesn't recognize him as God. He recognizes that he has authority, but he does not call him a prophet, but he calls him a teacher. In other words, in Nicodemus' mind, Jesus is probably a really gifted, spirit-empowered Pharisee rabbi of the law, but nothing more. It's very important to understand that Nicodemus, through all of chapter 3, does not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. It would be a significant overreading to think that Nicodemus saw Jesus as anything more than curiosity at this point. This is not the time when Nicodemus bows the knee. This is not the time when he truly believes in Jesus Christ. The, 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 the story actually leaves us hanging with Nicodemus' curiosity, but this is an across-the-table theological conversation, not one of deep internal heart transformation at this point. So in John chapter 3, we see that Nicodemus is curious about Jesus. One of the, the neat things that going through the Gospel of John is we see this progression because Nicodemus, which is, which is an extraordinary, extraordinary story of redemption, we actually do see him come to Christ. In that John chapter 3, he is curious about Jesus. In John chapter 7, before the whole Sanhedrin, he becomes that Jesus is so unique and special that he's willing to rise to the defense of Jesus publicly. And then in John chapter 19, Nicodemus is one of the few that we see at the cross of Christ after Jesus is crucified and partakes in taking down his body and burying his body along with Joseph of Arimathea. But at this juncture, Nicodemus and Jesus are discussing entry requirements into God's kingdom. And Jesus responds by saying, you must be born anew, born from above, born of water and spirit. Moses lifted up a serpent. There's, there's one who ascends and descends from heaven. And you read that and you go, what is going on? Jesus talks about wind blowing. What does all of these statements mean? And if, you, if you're confused, you're in good company. Because Nicodemus, who is a teacher of the Jews, teacher of Israel, did not understand this. He says, what, what do these things mean? Okay, here's a simple outline of what is at the core of this exchange. Simple outline, okay? It begins with a question. How can one enter the kingdom of God? How can one enter the kingdom of God? And this is implicit behind Nicodemus' questions. That question is followed by an answer. Be born from above. You must be born from above. So how can one enter the kingdom of God? Answer, you must be born from above. Question, how can these things be? How can these things be? Answer, you'll have to wait and see. I'm a poet and you didn't know it. It all rhymed together. So how can one enter the kingdom of God? Answer, you must be born again, born from above. Question, how can these things be? Answer, you'll have to wait and see as we get to the end of this text. Okay, so the first question, how can one enter the kingdom of God? Remember that Nicodemus recognizes Jesus with great calling and authority, calling him rabbi, calling him from God, saying that God is with him. Nicodemus clearly does not recognize Jesus, nor does he see him as the Messiah. That, that is explicit from the text. He gives these pleasantries, Nicodemus does, to Jesus. But Jesus cuts right to the core of what is at Nicodemus' heart concern. 
And this should not surprise us because at the end of chapter 2, it says that Jesus knows what's in the heart of man. So Jesus is sitting there. Nicodemus says, you're a rabbi, a teacher from God. And Jesus is almost like, Nicodemus, I know why we're here. I know what the question is burning on your heart. How do I get into the kingdom of God? And maybe implicit behind that question on Nicodemus's part is, have I done enough in order to gain entry into the kingdom of God? And Jesus says what? You, unless, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was forefront in the mind and the heart of the Jew. It, it, was, it was seen in the Old Testament as that final ingathering of the people of God where God would set up his earthly kingdom and they were looking for a promised one, a Messiah, who would come and make all things right. And so every Jew, and including Nicodemus, they're, they're looking for that day. Now many had kind of devolved that concept into just simply earthly deliverance from Rome instead of looking for a true messianic kingdom. But again, implicit in Nicodemus' interaction with Christ was probably a concern of him personally of, have I done enough? Have I done enough? And, and that's kind of implied through the questions he asked. Has he done enough to gain access to this kingdom of God, this salvation that grants citizenship before God? Nicodemus' lack of understanding and concern about the kingdom and yet his lack of security is really a tragedy because this is a leader at the heights of religious achievement and he's still unsure of his status before God. He's still not clear of what, what is required to gain access and to be reconciled to God. Now Nicodemus had all the right doctrines he believed in a creator God. He believed in a God who was transcendent. He believed in a God who was loving. He believed in a God who revealed himself. He believed in a transcendent being who was going to bring all things to his glory. He believed in moral truth from the law. He believed in all of the right doctrines. And yet, he stood unreconciled to God. Why? Because though he had all the right knowledge, somewhere in his heart, he believed that he still had a part to play that he had to work and he had to prove that he was worthy of the kingdom. Nicodemus had all the right doctrines. He worshiped the one true God. So the question we ask is, what was lacking? What was lacking? And you may be asking that question visiting today. And you say, I, I believe in God. I know all these things, but I still don't really know what it means and how I'm to gain entry into the kingdom of God, to heaven itself. And so Jesus answers. So the question, how can I gain entry? Here's the answer. You must be born from above. So we have a question and now an answer. You must be born from above. Culturally in our, in our country, we have used the moniker frequently, I am a born again Bible believing Christian. I'm a born again believer. What does that mean? I'm born again. Certainly that sounds ridiculous on the ears of the world. Maybe much like what Nicodemus said, I, I don't understand this, Jesus. How do I enter back into my mother's womb and be born again? The text literally reads, born from above or born again, and both interpretations are acceptable. Matter of fact, I would say both are implied, but actually from the context, I would say that I would favor the born from above. Here's why. Jesus is clearly articulating an origin that goes beyond the human. You must be born from above. You must come from a, a different lineage, from, from a different place of origin. Now, now, Nicodemus is confused. How can he enter and be reborn? You can actually see that there in verse 4. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? Now, notice the emphasis Nicodemus is saying, how can I achieve this feat? Can an old man enter back in? The emphasis of Nicodemus' question is on his own effort. If this is how you achieve heaven, how do I accomplish it? How do I affect this new birth? Well, Jesus said, you must be born from above. And then, and then he extrapolates what he means. 
Look at verse 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Okay. What does this mean? Five subpoints here. Five subpoints I want to give you on the meaning of verse 5 down to verse 8. What does this mean? Jesus' response. Number one, your new spiritual birth is not your work. Your new spiritual birth is not your work. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born, the imagery of the birth reminds us, oh, let me just ask you the question. What did you have to do in your birth? Uh, What did you do? Nothing. You came into being and were born by no will of your own, by no act of your own, and by no effect of your own. It's not your work. Still less with spiritual birth. So number one, your spiritual birth is not your work. Number two, your birth, your spiritual birth, must be from above. Born of, Jesus says, of water and the spirit. Of water and the spirit. Now, there are lots of creative theories about what this means. You know, people try to use some things that it, that it refers to different aspects of procreation and, and whatnot, or, or it refers to baptism. And there's lots of creative theories about what this means. But let me tell you what it really means, okay? Let me, let me tell you what it means. And the reason I can be so dogmatic on that is remember that Jesus says that Nicodemus should have understood this. And we pick that up down in verse 10. Are you the teacher of Israel, yet you do not understand these things? Which means that whatever Jesus is saying is something that Nicodemus should have understood as a teacher of Israel. Meaning, understanding the Old Testament law, understanding the prophets and what they said, my comment is not so radical. Turn with me, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Nicodemus should have understood this. He should have seen this. What does it mean, water and the spirit? Ezekiel 36, Old Testament prophet. He's talking about the renewal of Israel. Verse 22. Ezekiel 36. Therefore... Say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, that through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. Okay, verse 22 to verse 23 God is acting for his own namesake, for his own glory. Verse 24, notice, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean from your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. Verse 26, and I will give you a new heart And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of, uh, from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Jesus says, what I'm saying is nothing new. Entry into the kingdom requires a work of God. A work of God that cleanses us, that water cleansing, and a new spirit. So the water is a cleansing and the spirit denotes a new parentage, a new lineage, a transformation, a wholesale rebuild. 
The house has been condemned. It needs to be torn down. Nicodemus is saying, which walls should I paint? And Jesus says, you misunderstand me. A complete rebuild is required and it is nothing you can contribute to. I must fully cleanse and I must fully rebuild and the builder is the spirit. So number three, sub point. You need to be regenerated. That entry into the kingdom, into heaven, requires a new you. If you think you will enter heaven just being yourself, being true to yourself, and that you can stand before God and say, here I am, you will be barred entry. You cannot come to God in your current state. You must be transformed. We call this the doctrine of regeneration. That in regeneration, God implants a new heart together with a renewed will, affections, and desires. There's a technical term that we use called the ordo salutis, the order of salvation. There's the external call, the preaching of the gospel or the sharing of the gospel one-on-one. -on -one. Someone hears, that's the external call. And then there's the internal call, and this is the work of the Spirit where the Spirit moves on the heart, breaks the will, and implants a new heart for God in accordance with his divine providence and, and perfection. That God regenerates the heart, and as a result of regeneration, regeneration enables us now to believe, to have faith. Nicodemus, you need a total rebuild. You need to be totally regenerated from the inside out. You need to be transformed by an act of God. And number four, you need a new parentage. What is born of the flesh is of the flesh, Jesus says, but of the spirit, the spirit. Nicodemus, you are born of Adam. You have the curse of his sin. You have the parentage of the curse. You have the lineage of fallen man. You need a new parentage. What's amazing is that Jesus has flesh. But the virgin birth is absolutely critical because Jesus is born not of the line of Adam, but his parentage comes from the Holy Spirit. He's born of the Spirit so that he retains his divine lineage and nature and then unites himself with human flesh, which makes, in essence, at Christ, at Christmas time, at the incarnation, Jesus begins a new humanity that comes from above. A new parentage. A new Adam. Nicodemus, you need to be born again from above. Not of the line of Adam, but of the line of Christ. You need a new lineage. Number five. New birth is solely a work of God. New birth is solely a work of God. So what does this text mean? Number one, spiritual birth is not your work. Number two, you must be born from above. Number three, you need to be regenerated. Number four, you need a new parentage. Number five, this new birth is solely a work of God. Now, considering the earlier reference to Ezekiel, let's stay in context there. So turn back with me to Ezekiel 37 if you turned away from it. Uh, because Jesus uses this analogy of the wind blowing and the, bl the wind blows where it will, and it just seems very strange. Unless we stay in Ezekiel, which is where our minds are already at, where Nicodemus should have understood, and we come to this extraordinarily weird Halloween-ish type story. God takes Ezekiel to a valley full of dry bones, dead corpses, and God tells Ezekiel to breathe on them the gospel. And then this wind begins to rattle. And then sinews begin to connect and these corpses come alive. Ezekiel 37 verse 1 through 3. The hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? 
Now, our answer to that question is, if you're dead, you're dead. All right? There's no mostly dead princess bride type thing. <laughs> you know, he's mostly dead. Marriage. No. Okay. Cultural <laughs> reference back. Dead is dead. They're dead. Can these bones be made alive? Okay. I want you to breathe on them. And then there is a rattling and a wind blowing. The bones begin to rattle together. The corpses come alive. And Ezekiel 37, verse 12 to 14 says, You shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves, raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you. You shall live. I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, for I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. I can raise the dead to life. You cannot do it. You cannot bring yourself to life. We are spiritual corpses dead in our sin. It is only by the grace of God and the blowing of his spirit that can animate our dead souls and bring us to life. That's what Jesus is saying. Now Nicodemus then, then asked the next question. We have a question, an answer. Now the next question. How can these things be? How can these things be? be accomplished? How does God accomplish life out of death? Verse 9, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel you yet? You do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now he changes the conversation. How can these things be? Jesus says, let's turn the conversation towards me. The conversation now moves to a person. The conversation moves Christological. Verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. How will God bring new birth, a new parentage, a new lineage? How will he bring dead bones and dead sinners to life? Jesus says, well, you can't go up unless someone first comes down. Now, Old Testament and mythology of the Jews were very much believing that you could ascend into heaven, that certain people did, namely Moses and, and Elijah. They ascended into heaven, but no one's ever descended from heaven. Jesus says, this is only going to happen if one first descends from heaven. So you can ascend if someone else has descended. The Son of Man, the Word become flesh, me, that I have come down to what? To be lifted up for you. You see, he says, as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, and we studied this in the book of Numbers, chapter 21. The Israelites are in the wilderness and they're bit by all of these poisonous snakes and people are dying. And so God told Moses to erect a serpent on a stick and that whoever looked at that serpent would be healed of their infirmity. Now, why would God use the images of a serpent on a stick and then apply them directly to Christ? Holding aloft something on a pole or a stake was something you did to an enemy that you wanted to shame. The serpent was the symbol of Satan, Pharaoh, death, the original curse in the garden, God says, I have defeated the curse. I have defeated the serpent. I have defeated death. And if you look to that in faith, believing, you will be saved. Jesus then makes a direct line to himself in John chapter 3, verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up and exalted. This word in the Greek has the idea of exalted, that Jesus will be exalted, lifted up by means of the cross. And that how does new birth happen? 
How is this work of God accomplished? How are we made in life out of death? We look to Jesus who was pinned to the cross by our sin and that on the cross he disarmed the rulers and authorities, became the curse, defeated hell, defeated Satan and that whoever looks on him in faith are brought into his lineage and born afresh by the Holy Spirit. It is no work that you do. It is nothing that you can accomplish. How can these things be? What does Jesus say? And the answer is, the final answer, believe in the Son. Verse 15. Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. You see, Nicodemus is saying, what do I have to do? What must I accomplish? How can God possibly affect this great feat? And the answer is, because Jesus the Son descended, that through his exaltation on the cross, he forged a new lineage that like Moses held aloft the serpent, Jesus has been held aloft on our behalf, all we must do is look on him in faith. Not my work, all his work. And his work transforms us, regenerates us. And so the answer to Nicodemus, how may one gain entry into the kingdom of God? And you may be asking that question. What must I do? What church must I attend? What laws must I keep? And brother and sister on the authority of God's word, friend, if you're asking that question, the answer is simply this. Look to Jesus, believe on the crucified son who is both Lord God and man who died for your sins and on the basis of his work, not ours, we are regenerated and made new. In him is salvation. He is the gate into the kingdom of God. Belief. Belief. Would you stand with me this morning? With every head bowed and every eye closed. Have you believed? Have you believed? You can make that decision right now. Say, Lord, I am a sinner. I need a Savior. And then as a testimony of the genuineness of your faith, when this service is over, I'll be down here with pastors, with brothers and sister friends. Come and tell us about this decision that you've cried out to God about. Heavenly Father, so many things going on in the world. And we as Christians are trying to live in a way that honors you. Lord, I pray that you would remind us of the salvation that is accomplished only in the person of Christ. To stand fully upon that, not on our own religiosity or good works, but only in the strength of Christ. I pray that those here who have not made the decision to follow you, that they would believe today. They would have faith. They would act in response and say, I believe. As we go forward from here, no matter what happens, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, thanks be to God and Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ is on the throne and wins the day. We look forward to a kingdom not made by human hands, but a kingdom in the name of Christ. Until that day, may we walk as sojourners, pilgrims, faithful to stand for what is true. And in Jesus' name, do we pray all of these things. And all God's people said, amen. amen.